Chris Burns and welcome to The Network. Hard talk with a matrix of newsmakers. The headlines. Four years after the Europe-led and U.S.-backed airstrikes that helped bring down dictator Muammar Gaddafi, rival governments battle for power, devastating the country. Thousands of refugees flee to European shores, aggravating an already overwhelming situation for authorities grappling with thousands fleeing conflicts and hardship in other regions. Libya asks UN permission to import tanks, fighter jets and other weaponry to stave off advancing Islamic militants seizing oil fields. Should Europe and the U.S. intervene now and how? The hopes of Arab Spring shattered. How to save Libya from further chaos and bloodshed so near to Europe? And what to do about the refugees? How many to take in? How many to send back? Wired into this edition of the network here at the European Parliament in Brussels, Farida El Alagi, chargé d'affaires of the Libyan mission to the EU. Miriam Dali, multi-socialist, member of the European Parliament's delegation for relations with the Maghreb countries. She's also on the Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs. And Marc Pierini, visiting scholar at the think tank Carnegie Europe. And you're also a former EU ambassador to Libya. A question to all of you, uh, starting with uh, Farida. The chaos in Libya is similar to that in Iraq. We saw that the U.S. had toppled Saddam Hussein, and they were responsible for what was going on there. How much responsibility do the Europeans have in restoring stability to Libya? How much do they own Libya in that sense? Farida. Well, sadly, mistakes are being repeated. Uh, unfortunately, I wish they, have heard from, they have learned from past mistakes. Lib Libya today is not uh, well, not only the European, not owned by the European, uh, sadly enough, by many other players, regional and international players. Okay. Uh, for Mir Miriam, well, how much responsibility do the Europeans have here? I would say that the international community owes uh, its own responsibility to Libya because I look at Libya as the fulcrum in the sense that we need to have stability in Libya if we want stability in the Mediterranean and stability in Europe. Okay. Mark? Can well, you add mor anything to moral that? responsibility is one thing, but as long as you have three competing forces, the government in Tobruk, militias or a rival government in the west, right. and ISIS in the middle, uh, there is no military solution, as uh, EU foreign ministers uh, recently said. Right. So I mean, considering that, how likely is it that Lib Libya will split apart, perhaps along ethnic lines? How much could that destabilize neighboring countries? What, what is the danger of Libya splitting Lib apart for you? Li Libya, we are doing our very best never, ever to leave Libya to split apart. So this is one point that I need to clarify. So the, 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 the expectation that it might split apart now is the language that is in the international circles. So, uh, but you this don't think is it's going to happen? We hope not. Uh, we cannot see the future. The situation is revolving day by day. And the responsibility of the international community to move fast and to move quickly to okay. solve the major problems in Libya. Miriam, how much, I mean, y y your country is about 350 kilometers away from Libya, the closest European country there. How worried are you about that sp uh, split if that does happen? A civil war, if there is a civil war, how could that impact you, Europe, and the rest of the world? No, it will impact us greatly. We are concerned about what's going on in Libya. We want a united Libya. So what we are supporting first and foremost is to have a political solution to the situation in Libya because we want a united Libya. How are you going to do this? And this, this is a question now to Mark. How are you going to do this when you have two governments in Libya? A civil war you already have. A split you already have in actual fact. Um, so. I mean, remember what's happening in, in, in Syria and Iraq. Uh, as long as the parties do not want to negotiate, uh, it gives a space to fill for the Islamic State. So this is why the EU is supporting uh, the UN efforts. Okay, but how, Farida, how can you claim to be running the country when you're not even in, in, in the capital? Well, you can run a country wherever you are. Not necessarily you are in the capital. The capital is not secured. Killing and ISIS and everybody now is around the capital. So our hope is that, yes, political uh, dialogue, but definitely, I think, ensuring security, ensuring uh, um, uh, the, uh, the lifting of the embargo on the arms for the legitimate Libyan government is among the major solutions. There are so many others as well. Okay. What about, no, what should Europe be doing, uh, Miriam, as far as that goes? Should Europe, Europe be sending weapons? Should they be, uh, how should they be supporting the, the Tobruk government? 
I think that we need to energize the diplomatic efforts. So far, the European Union um, has been keeping a step back, I would say, when it comes to Libya. I would say that we had member states which were in denial when it comes to Libya. Things are moving now, but I think they should have moved much, much earlier. But I want to see a more of an energized diplomatic effort because I think that we need, first and foremost, a national unity government. And then we can start from there. And should that national unity government include, include the uh, elements of the Islamic State, Mark? Uh, no, we cannot talk to the Islamic State, be, and they don't want to talk to any uh, uh, former go other government. Uh, I think for the EU, the priority is first containment. Containment in Tunisia, containment in Okay, Egypt. and how do you do that? Well, you reinforce you the borders, you, you got, help... you got to do something with force, no? At the border, you can reinforce, uh, not militarily, but with counterterrorism, with police control, control on the smugglers. This is vital for the survival of Tunisia. It's also very important for Egypt. That's the first priority. Second priority is to support the UN efforts. But of course, in the end, ultimately, it depends on the Libyans themselves. <laughs> if I may, con yes, right if I may add now. We need, I think, the international community has to face their mistakes. For four years, we have been demanding okay. that. Okay, and how do, they, how do they face their mistakes? How do they, what should they, they do now? They were slow in securing the borders. They were slow in recognizing ISIS was in Libya and in there three years and a half ago. They were slow in supporting also the legitimate government and, the, and, and, and you know, the, the, the support of that needs to be given to the legitimate government, to the parliament. So the vacuum okay. that have been left by the international community have to be now retort again. And what should the international community be doing about the refugees? Miriam. If I may before, a national yes. unity government is part of the whole solution. Yeah. What I think we need really and truly is not a unilateral operation which involves a military operation. We need to see something which is mandated by the UN. We need to have the UN and also the Arab partners. I think that the Arab partners are key in, the, in finding a solution to what's happening in Libya. Because I believe first and foremost that it is up to the Libyan people to save Libya itself. If we need a solution which is successful, it has to be from the Libyan people to the Libyan people. Mark, very quickly. Uh, yeah, we need to, to emphasize this point. Uh, if there is no agreement between the Libyans themselves, at, at least uh, Tripoli and Tobruk, uh, the uh, actions of the international community uh, are only going to be very limited. The EU is ready, and has said that recently, to support militarily a UN resolution to maintain peace in Libya. That's peacemaking, you mean? Yeah. Right? That's use of force. What about the refugees? What are we going to do about the refugees? Miriam. We have to address the issue of refugees because what we're seeing at the moment... But how to do that? Okay. Um, we need to have border controls in place, but we need to have also an EU effort. So far, I'm not seeing um, a commitment from the EU to back an operation similar to the Mara Nostrum operation. But let's face it, Triton, as it is, is not addressing the situation. We need to save lives because the refugees we're seeing coming are refugees fleeing from war. Um, and something has to be done. Solidarity, first and foremost. And second, we need to also have the proper infrastructures in place to receive those refugees until they can go back to their countries. Rita, how much does that frustrate you that you're not, you're not getting that support yet? Yeah, 50 million euro has been allocated by the EU three or four years that's, ago that, for the much. borders. But nothing happened. Nothing happened. The borders were open. I think they were watching all those influx that were coming to Libya, ISIS and, and, and others. So in my opinion, that were the lessons that they have to be confronting and learning from. So I think now the EU have to speed up its action because these ISIS are doubling and tripling by the day and we cannot just wait resolutions keep talking about what should be done okay. once a, a unity government is formed. Mark, last word very, very quickly. For 20 years, the, the Qaddafi regime was literally exactly. exporting migrants from exactly. Western Africa. So there is a whole industry there. There is a know-how. Yeah. And we've been at work on this. Yeah. Now, the novelty is that ISIS is threatening to send half a million people yeah. over to Europe. So that is a counter-terrorism aspect. And we have to watch this and watch European jihadists going to join ISIS in Libya. That's the next danger. Okay, but what about the refugees? What do you do about them? Well, you help uh, the neighboring countries and you control the sea. Thanks, Mark. That's all the time we've got for now. I'd like to thank our guests Farida El Alagi, Miriam Dali, and Mark Purini. I'm Chris Burns, and until next time, thanks for connecting with the network.